In 1958, a survey taken in the United States stated that when it came to blood donations, paid blood donors had a 10 times higher chance of infectious diseases compared to those who volunteered. This was not at all surprising since it made sense that people who needed money to donate blood were more likely to suffer from problems in their life, including addiction to illicit substances. Substances that sometimes were injected via intravenous means. This was not as much of a concern for most people, but for people reliant on blood transfusions, this was a major issue. One such group was hemophiliacs. Hemophiliacs suffered from a defect in their blood that made them lack a protein that was called factor VIII. This led scientists to research ways to isolate the factor from healthy individuals who could produce it in their body. In 1964, factor VIII was isolated and concentrated in a manner that was transferable from one person to another. This was then commercialized in 1966. Factor VIII was not a synthetic product. It had to be donated from the blood of the healthy to those affected. Since it was blood that was being used, the main concern at the time was exposure to infectious diseases like hepatitis. While there were no tests for hepatitis A and hepatitis B, hepatitis C, which was just referred to as non-A, non-B hepatitis, I know, not the most creative, was not widely used yet. The test for hepatitis C was discovered in 1965, but it took decades before it was widely used. Despite the concerns, Factor VIII quickly became a popular product. It became a lifesaver for those with severe hemophilia. By the end of the 1960s, the demand for Factor VIII was so widespread that it had become common practice for producers to use paid volunteers. The demand was so high that the screening of these paid volunteers was minimal to non-existent. In 1969, one of the sources of Factor VIII was an area known as Skid Row. Skid Row was a place in Los Angeles known mainly for a high rate of homelessness, addiction, and intravenous drug users. To make matters worse, it was also common practice that blood donations would be pooled together to produce Factor VIII products. The high-risk blood was both cheaper and more readily available than other low-risk sources. In conjunction with all of this, there was also a practice of blood pooling multiple donor groups. Because of the manufacturing process of Factor VIII, it was much quicker to mix multiple sources than isolate one set of sources at a time. The risk was pretty obvious. It only took one donor from one source infected with hepatitis C to contaminate a large pool of otherwise healthy blood. Despite these obvious problems, Factor VIII sales continued. Eventually though, something was going to give, and that's when we get into the 1970s. Complacent practices in isolation aren't always an issue. However, when complacency becomes a norm across the industry, that's when problems start to stack up. In 1973, the United States National Blood Institute started to notice the problem. They reminded everyone of that pesky prisoner effect. They were hoping pharmaceutical companies would stick only to the blood of volunteers to avoid risk of blood contamination. That was wishful thinking. The demand for Factor VIII was going through the roof, and nothing short of an outright ban was going to stop most companies from using paid donors. This high demand from drug companies created a parallel industry dedicating to find paid donors willing to sell their blood for less. These companies found their ideal candidates, prison inmates. Okay, so they were ideal for the companies, not so much for the patients. The inmate solution worked because they didn't need the money for anything beyond prison canteen. They were stationed at one spot, so that saved company the cost of going to multiple locations to retrieve the blood. To highlight how profitable this was, in 1978, one prison had about 300 inmates that would regularly send blood to private companies at a cost of $11.15 per donated unit. That firm would then sell the blood to drug companies for about $30 per unit. This netted one company a yearly profit of $100,000 US. In today's terms, that would be $400,000 US or about $1,333 of profit per inmate. For Factor VIII, the biggest concern people had at the time was the exploitation of high-risk donors for the profit of large corporations. Little did people know, a bigger, more serious problem was on the horizon. The end of the 1970s was marked by a buildup of reckless practices that put the lives of many people at risk. The beginning of the 1980s sadly elevated that risk to an entirely new echelon by the emergence of the human immune virus known as HIV. Now, keep in mind, the disease most likely started to spread before the 1970s, but it was at this point that people started to take notice. Now, whenever any new virus or disease emerges in the general population, 
it takes a certain amount of time for scientists to be able to grasp what's going on. In that time, a disease can spread silently without anyone knowing. The unique element in this case was the disease affected the blood supply that was needed for medical use. The doctors were not aware that they were exposing hemophiliacs and other people reliant on blood to a very deadly disease. Hemophiliacs themselves, though, started to realize there was a serious problem. In 1982, hundreds of cases involving a mysterious immune disease came about. People knew there was something bad going around, but could not really put a finger on it. Whatever was going around, it was going rapidly among hemophiliacs. The blood pooling practices were amplifying the spread. To highlight how bad it was, depending on the viral load, it took as little as one donor per 1,000 to contaminate an entire batch meant to produce a factor VIII isolate. In a non-mixing situation, if the HIV rate was 50 per 1,000 high-risk donors and each pool contained 10 donors, the exposure rate would be less than 5%, or only a max of 5 out of 100 batches would get contaminated. But if 1,000 donors or more were mixed at a time, every batch was likely to get exposed. In 1982, the CDC organized a meeting regarding screening for blood banks. This was the first of a series of unsuccessful attempts to ring the alarm bells. They were met with stiff resistance from almost every group. Blood banks argued that restricting the blood supply was not merited due to a simple suspicion of a blood disease. In their mind, a smaller blood supply would risk more deaths to people needing a blood transfusion and clotting products. The pharmaceutical companies would also agree with this sentiment, although their concerns were more financial. For the private industry, high-risk donors had become very profitable. From their perspective, if the non-profit blood banks refused to exclude them, why would they? Another problem with these meetings was that the Food and Drug Administration declined to get involved, basically telling the CDC that they were on their own and would simply have to ask for voluntary compliance. The reluctance would start to wane down though, as the cases of the disease started to grow higher and higher and higher. Private companies eventually started to fear potential future lawsuits and started to steer away from high-risk donors altogether. Blood banks, on the other hand, refused, and they represented about 20% of the blood supply. Their argument was the same. The cost of a blood supply shortage was just too high to those in need. They would continue that reluctance until the HIV virus was officially discovered before the end of that year. This allowed for laboratories and hospitals to sample and test for the virus. Hundreds and hundreds of Factor VIII recipients got tested. Everyone hoped for the best. Obviously, a 0% rate was impossible at that point, but as long as it was less than 25%, it would be a relief to many families. The results came in, and about 50% of Factor VIII recipients in the United States tested positive for HIV. This information put the blood industry at a standstill. High-risk donors now would be excluded all across the board. Low-risk blood needed to be processed. The only method at the time to eliminate the virus beyond screening was a newly pioneered heating method. The problem was, it would not only kill the pathogen that caused the HIV virus, but would also kill many other elements of the blood. While this was no problem for blood transfusions in general, it was a major problem for Factor VIII products as it killed the crucial Factor VIII that was needed. However, for many, it was better to be safe than sorry. Factor VIII's history was tragic enough with what happened up to that point alone. Sadly, the saga did not end there. The banning of Factor VIII from high-risk and unheated sources created a large inventory of blood products for many pharmaceutical companies. There were two options at that point destroy the supply and take a huge financial hit, or sell it to countries that had not banned high-risk sources yet. In one of the most greed-driven, reckless decisions by the pharmaceutical industry, at least three companies opted to sell their blood products overseas. Between 1984 to 1989, multiple U.S. companies and at least one German company continued to export high-risk factor eight products to Britain, France, Japan, and many other nations. This was on top of an already unregulated Factor VIII supply circulating worldwide. At that stage, the true extent of the damage caused was never going to be realized. Keep in mind, this wasn't one or two companies in some isolated incident. These were multiple companies independently making the same egregious decision at a time where HIV was practically a death sentence. By the beginning of the 1990s, the bulk of the damage had already been done. The protocols to prevent contaminated blood were put in place, 
but those that relied on factor 8 between 1980 to 1984 had already been exposed at a dangerously high level to HIV and hepatitis C. In fact, more than 50% of the hemophiliac population between 1980 and 1984 were infected with HIV. Many of them died afterwards. In total, 6,000 hemophiliacs contracted HIV in the United States. About 4,000 of them ended up dying. Another 1,400 were infected in Japan, 3,890 in the UK, and thousands more across the globe. While it may have been somewhat understandable for drug companies to sell the risky unheated batches of Factor VIII prior to 1986, the continued sales of it afterwards was reckless at best and criminal at worst. Actually, it's just criminal, period. In the United States, the companies ended up paying a total of $660 million in fines and settlements. However, no one was charged on criminal grounds, and many hemophiliacs in underdeveloped nations never got compensated. The real extent of the damage may never be seen, as many of the patients were never properly registered before receiving Factor VIII in their respective countries. Factor VIII products were meant to be a life-saving innovation. For the first decade, they were nothing but that. But later on, it had become a disaster due to a series of bad decisions, overzealous advocacy groups, opportunistic private companies, and a lack of public awareness. These, along with an absent regulatory body, all led to this tragedy. The behavior of the pharmaceutical companies that exported the contaminated supply is non-excusable and should be a textbook example of why we need stronger regulations and more public awareness. Sadly, however, this lesson was learned the hard way. If you like this video, make sure to click like and subscribe, and thanks for listening.